I'm Mason Mount. You're listening to the London is Blue podcast. And welcome back, Chelsea fans, to another episode of the London is Blue podcast. Joining me as always, your hosts, myself, Brandon, Nick, and Dan, but special guest, longtime friend, longtime listener, first time guest, Yannick. Oh, yeah. What do we call you, Yannick, the football therapist or the stat man? I mean, you have all these different personas out there. Well, maybe just Yann. And can I say, boys, what an episode for me to be making my debut on this fine podcast let it be known as Christian Pulisic Day or Christian Pulisic <laughs> episode on the London is Blue podcast. And it's a pleasure to be here. It is great to have you. We've gotten to hang out with you a couple times in London. Uh, obviously, for those that have seen the George Benson football vlogs, uh, the four of us were making rowdy appearances in the background of those. So uh, this will be fun. Yeah. Obviously, uh, for those of you that don't know Yan. Uh, doing a ton of amazing work on YouTube. Links in our descriptions. Go check him out. Um, and we usually do share out his stuff. So hopefully you're familiar. Uh, but jumping into today, uh, or I guess before we get into today, Dan, you had a really cool opportunity to uh, run into one of our listeners and meet up this weekend, didn't you? I did, yeah. So it was nice to get to meet up with Josh and his family and their their little son, Eden, and enjoy or find out that in... Most of Seattle, that uh, the local supporters bars are 21 plus, so we had to find a different place to watch the game and that accepted their child. <laughs> so we ended up finding a place. We had a good time. But he was from Austin, so he missed out on the Austin Fan Fest that, uh, crazy enough, uh, Gonzalo Higuain, um, you know, lookalike, Mike Ryan, our friend Mike Ryan Weiss was at, mm. and that was, uh, <laughs> it was very good, Nick. Yeah, thinner. Let's... He's a thinner Iguain. Um, probably a little bit more lettuce on the top there. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, Austin looked incredible for those who were there. Like, it looked amazing on TV. Bravo. Well done to NBC. Well done to the, the Chelsea and America teams and, and everyone who was involved. That looked awesome. And then, Nick, again, you met into longtime friend, uh, trip goer on our inaugural trip to London, Derek, didn't you, last weekend? Yeah, so this is really cool. I was in Boulder for a wedding, and uh, Derek Kernan Johnson, uh, who is you know probably one of the OGs, uh, oh yeah, as a listener on the show, uh, he he came out to Avery Brewing Company, which was a delight, um, and and had a couple of beers. We talked some shop, and and he went on his merry way. But he just wanted to come say what's up since I was in his hometown, and that's freaking incredible. So uh, just mad shout out to him. And like this all just comes back to the fact of the Chelsea community that we are so passionate about. And now, you know, it's kind of funny as we've extended our community across the pond, as they say, you know, we're hanging out with the Ann as well for this episode. But again, it just goes back to the kind of the why. I think for a lot of us of why do you watch a team that's thousands of miles away that you never get to see in person? It's about these connections that we make. And so just a huge shout out to all of you guys out there in the Chelsea community. It is what makes it brilliant. But let's go ahead and dive into what we're going to be doing today. So the overall theme of today's show will be the Pulisic performance, and that is uh, S-I-C-K at the end, thanks to Nick's <laughs> wordsmithing there, because man, was Christian just doing the business yesterday. So in this episode, we will be talking about Christian, a little bit more about Pulisic, and then we'll come back to Christian as well, make sure we just Smart, cover yeah. all of that. Uh, <laughs> the midfield and the strong <laughs> efforts of the two men who are just cleaning up that there, and the how and why behind the two goals that we conceded. Uh, and then obviously a little Discord lightning round for some questions. Uh, Dan, we do have one more iTunes review, so I'll go ahead and give a little love real quick before we jump into the giveaways. Yeah, the Great North getting it done again. A little five-star love on Apple Podcasts from uh, Yuan Dulu. And uh, yeah, just a, a nice thing to wake up, see a five-star review from Apple Podcasts. We appreciate that. Leave another heading into this coming week, maybe with uh, your favorite Pulisic moment of this past match. And we'll get those read out on the next episode. Yep, and a huge uh, shout out to all of you on Patreon again. You are the lifeline of my match day madness. Thank you. Uh, lastly, Nick, real quick, uh, some contests or some discount codes for our listeners. Correct. Uh, f first and foremost, our, our Instagram account is back live. Hey! Which is, yeah, which is... 
just tremendous. Um, it, it was down for a little bit for, for reasons that I will not say for fear of the overlords listening. Um, but uh, we got it back. So at London Blue Pod on Instagram, we're going to start posting content again there. We started a second channel that we'll be putting the uh, the breaks on, but probably still keeping because of snafus in the future. Um, in case of emergency, Nick. Yep, in case break, of emergency. Break in case of emergency. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Um, so we'll have more stuff going on there. But just want to let everyone know that. Uh, we are still doing our uh, Christian Pulisic uh, jersey giveaway. All you have to do to enter, all you have to do, very simple. Go to anchor.fm forward slash London Blue Pod, and uh, you will be able to leave a voice message, leave some support, leave an encouraging message, tell them how great he was today. Anything will uh, will qualify you to be entered in to uh, to win the uh, brilliant away Pulisic kit that Dan so lovingly adorned on in the photos that you saw on on social media. So that is the thing that's going on right now. You can obviously take 10% off with code London pod, uh, on world soccer shop. So do that. And then finally talisman caps, London blue 10, uh, that will get you 10% off $35 or more for these sick caps. All right. Well, here we go. It is time to do the Burnley match review. It was a Premier League match at Turf Moor this past Saturday. Scoreline, Burnley 2, Chelsea 4. Tell you what, uh, 4-0 was looking great, and all of a sudden it got a little sketchy at the end. So Pulisic started his hat trick in the 21st minute, uh, doubling down in the 45th, and then sealing it in the 56th minute. William, a couple minutes later, getting in on the party in the 58th minute. And then right at the end of the match, Burnley, Rodriguez, 86th minute, McNeil, 89th minute. I'm not going to touch too much on that uh, because there is a lot, a lot that we will talk about in regards to those. But, Dan, real quick, run us through the lineup for this match. Yeah, the lineup that's starting to settle just a bit. It's not the copy and paste Mauricio Sarri lineup that we saw last season, but we've got Kepa between the sticks, Aspilicueta, Tomori, Zuma, Alonso in that back four, the Kovacic, Jorginho pairing in the two, the Mount William Pulisic behind one and only Tammy Abraham. We saw Willie Caballero, Mark Gehi. We had James, Pedro, for the first time in a long time, on the bench. hudson Adoy, Giroud, and Mishi Bashwai as our bench for this match. All right, Yan, as you take a drink, I'm going to catch you off guard here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, But what, it, what were your initial thoughts when you saw the lineup? Obviously, Chelsea have been playing you know, matches every three, four days for a couple weeks now. Uh, we saw a little bit of rotation, but not too much from Frank. Okay, so... Well, obviously, there's one big surprise in there, which would be Christian Pulisic. And by the way, when you were running through the goals there, Brandon, you forgot a, a vital word when you said Pulisic completed his hat trick. He completed a perfect hat trick. And that's a really important salient point, remember, from a guy who I don't think he scores any headers. But anyway, I know we're going <laughs> to just dissect that later. But the left foot, like, left foot, right foot header, like, damn, you know, I don't think, I can't remember a Chelsea player to score a perfect hat trick for Chelsea. Anyway, point I being, think, I think uh, Chidge always says that Kerry Dixon did it a, a few okay. times back in well, the day. Oh yeah, it's, we're going back in the eighties, aren't we? Drogba, ha- Drogba has done one too. Okay, yeah, right, fair enough. Drogba's a good shot. I know Hazard scored a couple of hat tricks, but he neither of them would be perfect hat tricks because he wouldn't have got his head on. You know, he scored that one header and he lost his shit. Remember, <laughs> he started tapping his head and running around. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I digress. Line up, man. Yeah, so Pulisic's obviously the big one on them. But the thing is, right, I was the pre-match presser when Lamps was talking about this, and I he re- ran through the injuries, and he didn't mention Emerson. He said, yeah, Rudy's still out, and Golo's still out, you know, Loftus-Cheek is well out. Um, but he didn't say uh, Emerson is injured still, so maybe he's not even on the bench I'm seeing here, so maybe he hasn't just... Uh, selected him and maybe he's gonna give Alonso a run on the side as, as long as he's in form until he um you know it gets tired or drops form so that's an interesting one I thought he might be considered if uh, if fit but generally like you boys say it's a pretty um pretty settled side now and yeah Pulisic earns his start so yeah that's that was you know my overwhelming re- reaction was about that as was your guys you guys I, su- I assume 
Yeah, a, a little excitement. So hmm. quick Google search. Um, Gianluca Vialli versus Barnsley in 97. Jimmy Floyd yeah. Hasselbank versus the Ooh. Tottenham Hotspur in 2002. Uh, Solomon Kalou. All right. <laughs> He's done it versus Stoke wow. City in 2010. Drogba oh, versus Wigan in 2010. That's when we were just pummeling teams yeah. back then. Oh. And Ancelotti. Exactly. And then I'm trying right. to quick scroll through the end. Uh, and then Pulisic versus Burnley in 2019. So, so in the last like decade. Yeah. yeah and so obviously, that's just Chelsea. I think there's only 31 players in the Premier League era who have ever done it. So well, And mm-hmm. the last one to do it was Aguero one or two seasons ago. So yep. it's, oh, it's yeah, been a while. He's done it twice. Cheap and they codes. were both against Newcastle <laughs> in 2015 and 2018. Yeah, so. um, all right. Well, top line stats, Chelsea was 63% possession, 16 shots, 7 on target, to Burnley's 13 shots, 5 on target. Uh, and from there, Chelsea with the two yellow cards to Burnley's three. Uh, as we look at this, at Kaylee underscore graphics, giving us the expected goals, um, this is this is interesting. Burnley were a 1.9 expected goals. Chelsea were a 1.1 1. 1, uh, expected goals. Yan the stat man here. Uh, that's yeah. not how stats work. This is breaking the model. Four <laughs> goals off a of 1.1 1. 1 expected. Yeah, I did see that yesterday as well. Now, okay, right. So expected goal metric, right, is measured by like a really sophisticated amount of data like how many times said goals have been scored before with people in certain positions and you know the, the ch- average chances and stuff so it is I, I, as much as I like stats and stuff XG I generally understand how it's generated but for me maybe you speculate the goals that were scored you know perhaps a really 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 difficult chances which might be more testament to you know young christian pulisic and maybe uh, this is tongue-in-cheek by the way don't take this seriously but maybe they saw christian pulisic like no he doesn't score headers that's not how he's built (laughs) so so he scores a header and it breaks the xg system but you know joking aside um yeah i mean that's the thing it did seem like chelsea were completely in control but they didn't have any you know they didn't man city carve open the defense and roll the ball across the six yard box you know which obviously would would be an expected goal essentially so it is interesting i guess maybe because burnley having a better xg remember they had two barnes had like three golden chances that one when he just needs to tap it in with his head that's the kind of stuff that's going to crank up your xg that that he's missed but low scoring here's a stat question though barnes expected goals or hands up in the air asking for something which was the higher total in this match because i feel Uh, like every time (laughs) every time you saw him it was hands up in the air and him just flailing around looking for help from that the heavens from the underworld, I don't know what he was looking for help from, but it clearly was not coming from anyone else around him on the pitch. Lampard called him out in his post-match press conference. I know, too, it was Barnes. great. <laughs> can, I, you know? can I just take a second on this, right? I'm, pl- I'm pleased you said that, Dan, because, yeah, Lampard did call him out, Brandon, you're right, but Sean Dyche, right? I like Sean Dyche. He's, uh, he's savvy. He's a, yeah, he's an old school English manager, and he's, he, he knows how to... He, I watched his press conferences, and he's so slyly, he's basically digging out Chelsea. He's constantly digging out hudson Adoy for his dive. Like, I mean, you can get to that later and discuss whether you think it was a dive or not, but he was like... He wants. He, he does that. No, take nothing away from it. Chelsea were better. Chelsea were better. But we need to get us out of the game. It's ruining the game. Why would he do that? He's a talented player. And that was his immediate post-match reaction. And then I watched his presser again before we we started recording and doing the show. And he slowly nurses it in, right, man. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, but you know, he's a talented player, and he's talking about the diving and you know the respect for the game. And then he slips in a comment like, maybe you know they've got a great feeling at the moment, you know, great narrative, they're doing really well. Maybe this changes the narrative of their season a little bit, you know, the kid, the kids diving. I don't know. And I'm just thinking, wow. you oh, shut up, dude. He's really what trying to like slowly massage it in. What are the odds that that actually happens? I don't think very high. Um, <laughs> how, many, how many people are actually watching him say that apart from losers like me? So <laughs> I don't think it's going to change the narrative. Mo- most people who watch the Ashley Barnes uh, theatrics, I would say, um, mm. would would say it's super rich coming from a guy who's nearly broken Nemanja Matic's leg yeah, right, and yeah. who's gotten into every scuffle with every kind of big-time Chelsea player over the last five, 10 years, whatever Mm. this guy, I I don't know him as a person. He could be a lovely person. I would guess not, but like it, 
he is a bastard coated bastard with bastard filling. Uh, well, that, that's why, why they that should guy. rename Turf Moor to the shit houseery, and that just <laughs> should be where they play. Well, it's rich because you know only are notoriously masters of the dark arts, and that doesn't come with just being you know shit houseery, aggression, leaving a foot in, time wasting. That comes with theatrics. They do it all, man. So it's rich from Sean Dodge to come out, but he's just playing the game, and he yeah. so whatever. Are they the new? Well, can you do it on a rainy night in Stoke? Is that there? Are they filling that I role think in the Premier so. this season? They are. They are. And I'm glad you brought that up, Brandon, because I was chatting to my mate and we were talking about, he, he was talking about whether Pulisic can do it in the Premier League. You know, players come come down to the Premier League. and <laughs> you know, it and Burnley the, on a rainy night. Uh, can, can he do it at a night on Turf Moor? <laughs> when, he's, when he's just doing glancing back headers, like, not Bob's mate. Here we go. Hat trick. What? You know, I was like, yeah, you can do it in the Premier League. Absolutely. Yeah, Mike well, well, we can get into it. But yeah, I was, you know, I was a little concerned about Pulisic and how we deal with the physicality. Apparently, if you just run by them, you don't have to worry about it. So he he solved that puzzle real quick. Mm. Uh, but yeah, right out the gates, uh, Pulisic perfection was what everyone had the chance to witness as both groups, those calling for Christian to get his opportunity and those who were also looking to be shown something, uh, waiting for him to kind of prove himself at this level, finally got to see what our fellow countryman was all about. So in his first career hat trick, he ends up scoring with the left foot, the right foot, and the header as well. The perfect hat trick, as Jan mentioned. So uh, not a bad trip for his first little visit to to Turf Moor. Um, You know, he obviously scored in the 21st, 45th, and 56th minute. And you have Draw Sam on Discord saying, which was your favorite Pulisic goal and why was it all of them? (laughs) <laughs> so obviously nick uh a little bit of a leading a question there uh yeah. in the court of law that wouldn't fly but uh here we can discuss and why was it all of them that's awesome um yeah I, I think his first goal was absolutely outstanding um you know it's it's the kind of goal we were talking before we got on the show it's the kind of goal that mason mount scored at stanford bridge against lester where he he was just out of control pressing and because Burnley wasn't super comfortable playing out of the back, they misplaced the pass. He picked it up, ran by one defender, ran by the second defender, did a little step over, then places it perfectly in the corner. And I mean, look, I, I think as the as as the American podcast, you know, we're we're probably gonna get a lot of eye rolls from across the pond here. And but like, I think he was just class today. And yeah. to me. To me, I like got so proud watching him play so well. He he clearly kind of earned his chance to start after a couple of really solid substitute performances, and for for him to go out and and put on a show in a really really difficult place to play. And like I don't understate that. I think Deitch knows what he's doing clearly, and mm-hmm. you know they're much better than they were last year. Um, it was it was a special for me, man. Mm. No, absolutely, like. Joking aside, as Americans, you have every right to be incredibly proud of him because he's not only was it the immense warmings at a very, very difficult venue and probably not the easiest of conditions in terms of time of year and stuff, but it's the whole narrative of how things have gone and how he's dealt with it and how he's held himself. He hasn't been like big price tag and has our replacement coming in and out, maybe he played the whole time, scored a couple of goals. He, he sat on the bench. He was he voiced his frustrations in a personal manner. He came on. He made the difference. He's made high-profile differences since coming off the bench. And he's absolutely announced himself um, on, on, you know, the Premier League's the best league in the world. So I want to say the world stage, but he's done Champions League. He's done international football. But he's scored a perfect hat-trick in the Premier League at a very difficult away venue. You know, if that doesn't make you proud as, like, you know, your countryman's talisman, which he is, and he's only 21 as well, man. I mean, again, for for a barometer, I did a video on on this today that I cited it, Nicola Pepe, he costs 72 million, he hasn't scored a goal in open play yet in the Premier Mm -hmm. League in like 650 odd minutes. You know, Pulisic's just banging the perfect hat-trick away at Turf Moor, you know, Pepe might just get bodied away at Turf Moor, so all things considered, superb performance, and just to, to finish up, my favourite goal, you're right, the, the first goal is the best because it depicts what he is stylistically. And when you were describing it, Nick, you also failed to mention that it looked like the chance was gone. 
Do you know what I mean? When when he's, he stops, he's like, oh, he's, he's bottled yeah. it, he's stopped. Oh, no, he's just weighed it up and now he's absolutely finished it. But for me, it's got to be the header because, I mean, it's a header from Christian Pulisic. It's glancing back. And to be honest, I'd enjoy it equal as much if he did it deliberately or if he didn't know much about it <laughs> for different reasons. <laughs> if he means it deliberately, <laughs> amazing. If he didn't know much about it, he was just sort of jumping and it flew in for a perfect hat trick. I'll enjoy both equally in the same measure. But um. Well, he he did drop with the uh, the Jordan uh, kind of shrug celebration afterwards, and mm-hmm. that was the perfect response for the header. I I actually thought the second goal was really interesting because I actually thought it hit side netting. I didn't think it had went in at least from the the broadcast view of it. And mm-hmm. so as it flashes, the, as he's running to go celebrate. I'm like, wait, wait, oh, that actually went in. Okay, um, he doesn't celebrate corners. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got another one, coach. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think this was just an exceptional performance. I think it's happy. You know, we're all happy to be very excited for him. I mean, he jumps into the massive many way tie for 20th in terms of goals scored in the Premier League because he's uh, on three right now. He's our third best scorer in the Premier League at the moment, ahead of William, ahead of Ngolo Kante, uh, just behind Mason Mount at four. So, very quickly, he's inserted himself, and he's going to make it difficult, which is the best thing that we could hope for. He's going to make selection difficult for Frank because if he's banging in goals, if you know Hudson Odoi comes in, and starts banging in some goals, Williams adding goals, then this is just a great problem to have. And thank you, Christian, for making Frank Lampard's life more difficult from a selection headache. I, I would quickly say to like, we were talking about Christian, right? And I think early on. One of the criticisms that Frank gave to him, you know of his performances, you know, was that he didn't necessarily play defensively the way that he wanted him to, and uh, I thought there was a lot of trust shown to him against Ajax. There was a lot of trust shown to him today to play on the left when you clearly could put William there, who's been fantastic defensively this year. So uh, you know, I think to push William out to the right um, and you know, for Frank to trust him defensively was a huge deal. And I think he played that role really well. I mean, Alonzo clearly, you know, coming off Dan, like to me just is a legs issue. Like he's been playing a lot of football and in a very short amount of time. And, you know, I think just need a little bit of a break, but I think that Pulisic played really well tracking back and pressing and making sure that none of the, um, Stoke come Burnley players were, uh, um, we're comfortable on the ball uh, in the defensive third. Hmm. Yeah, there, there were some there were some good comments from Frank after the match, talking about all of this. And I know the backstory and the pressure of a move like that. I know he's played for his country throughout the summer and only had one week's break. I've tried to deal with it in the way that I see best, which is to give him minutes. He's played games this season already, but I've also got good competition in that area, and I need them all trying to perform when they get in the team. Christian's been doing that recently from the bench. He fully deserved the start today. And it was a fantastic match-winning performance. I know what a good player is because I see it up close every day. There are obviously things he has to learn and improve because he just turned 21, and it's the same as all other young players. But he knows that, and he knows I'm driving that daily in training. So just it, perfect, right? In line with what Frank has been saying, what Christian's been saying, Brandon, and it just puts us in a – again, it's a great feel-good moment because he's come good on being – doing what he was asked to deliver upon and Frank is giving him the adequate reward and praise, but also tempering the expectation too, that there's still more to do. There's still room to grow. And I think that's knowing that we're not at Christian ceiling is probably the wonderful question mark and exciting piece that's going to come out of this too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think just to real quick wrap this up on the, on the favorite goals part, uh, to me, it was the first one, obviously, because it was a momentum builder. But also, the second one did take a deflection, which, hey, hang, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a lucky break. He couldn't but, buy a goal and then got that. So, exactly. awesome, you know, cool. And, and, and then, like, while it was fun to watch him score the third goal, uh, it's just not my favorite because it's not as important to him. He's not going to go build his season off of banging in headers all season. So again, You don't know just, that. Uh, you don't, you don't know, know that. that. Mm, okay, well... <laughs> 
<laughs> Stick them on the fall post. I have been watching the U.S. men's <laughs> national team the last, you know, six years. So I yeah, have an but idea. They don't, they don't have Frank Lampard coaching. Okay, let's just keep that in mind. Let's not yeah. get into that discussion. <laughs> um, but anyways, that's why. It's just that's what he builds his game off of is his change of pace, standing up defenders, and then, and then you know, putting them off balance to fire home. So, yeah, super excited for, for him on that. And obviously it was brilliant to see it. Opta Joe tweeting one Christian Pulisic is the first player from the US of A to score for Chelsea FC in the Premier League. The Blues have now had players from 36 different nations score for them in competition, excluding own goals. I wonder what that would rise it to. Uh, 2010 from Opta Joe again. Christian Pulisic is the first Chelsea player to score a perfect Premier League hat trick since Didier Drogba against Wigan in May 2010. And then lastly, off to Joe coming in with the 21 years, 38 days. Christian Pulisic today became Chelsea FC's youngest hat trick score in Premier League history, beating Tammy Abraham's record that stood for 42 days. Wow. He's, he's hating that, isn't he? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and then one tweet I saw just to kind of um, wrap this up. It, it's And that's just, just kind of an American thing. Or no, I won't even get into that. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. But uh, Nick, I think just to wrap it up, you and I both it, oddly, maybe not oddly, felt an overwhelming sense of pride at watching Christian Pulisic do this, uh, just because of our the bond we have from nationalities and both you know all of us being American, watching him going out and doing the business in the Premier League, but more specifically for the team that we love so much. Um, when you said that you were proud, I was like, that was just the, that was the word that I had the strongest affinity to yesterday. I was like, like not emotional, but like it, it gave me the feels without a doubt. Yeah, man. I, I like watching him assist, you know, and I'm cool with him being an assist master, you know, Juan Mata made an entire career on that, um, scoring the odd goal here or there. But, uh, I, I really wanted it for him, which I know does nothing for his ability, <laughs> Uh, to have a whole bunch of people want for him, but uh, no, I'm just I'm proud. I'm very proud. Um, you know, I think there's still a little bit of stigma around him being an American. I think there's still a little bit of stigma about his price tag. I think, you know, he's not, you know, not yet mastered all the press opportunities he's given, and he's going to get better there. Like he has a lot of work to do, but but Jesus, like if you can't be happy for a guy scoring his first Premier League goal after all the pressure that's been put on him. I just I don't know what to tell you. Like th- there are so, there are some Americans out there that are so desperate to look cool to to Yannick that they that they want so much to be like oh he's, you know whatever it's not a big deal. Like, you can be happy for him. He started a Premier League match. He scored a fucking hat trick. You can you can be happy for him and still want the team first. And just know that it's okay. God damn, man. Some people are yeah. incredibly frustrating. Dude, can I just pick up on that? Because when you were saying, you know, this stigma about him being American, I think myself, like many Chelsea fans or like English Chelsea fans, were hyped that he's an American because he's, he's um, you know, MLS is, you know, I was going to say arguably, but it's quite a low level of soccer, football. But that's why it's it's sort of an exotic exciting thing to have an elite player you know he's been elite since he was 15 years old everyone knows about christian pulisic and it's cool and it's interesting because he is the american player that is really really mm-hmm. good so there was no like stigma everyone's hyped on it like um both at turf moor the away fans and in the dressing room it looks like pulisic's chant is just gonna be usa usa <laughs> USA. <laughs> but you know when you've got like you know 50 year old fat skinheads from like London with you know just truck beer and they're just loving Blissick scoring perfect hat, hat trick sco- chanting USA I mean he's gonna love that you know it, it's 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 fun and it's uh everyone's excited and buzzing on it so it's like I said it's exotic and different he's a professional he's well mannered he speaks fluent English or he speaks really good American so um <laughs> so you know it's, he's not like Pedro trying to like squint and understand what he's saying half time he's like a well-mannered professional kid who speaks well and it's exciting because it's different you know what I mean it's all very well having a kid from like West London or somewhere from South London coming through and you know having well-mannered kids but it's different man everyone's hyped on Pulisic so it's interesting to hear what you said Nick about like you know certain Americans that want to pe- say whatever do you know what I mean right and, and my feedback is not that I think a lot of our British friends are are anti him because no. I I don't I didn't get that sense when we were there in September and and frankly I'm not getting that from 
from the poison that is Twitter at times. Like, you know, I'm, I'm getting it from Americans who I think are just so scared of wanting their one of their own to yeah, be good yeah. that it's like, it's like walking on eggshells. And I'm like, man, like, you can be critical of his performances when he doesn't play well, and that's fine. Just like any other player on this show this year, Dan, how many we have talked about damn near every player in a positive light, and our save, you know, we have saved our Pulisic watch to like the very last thing on the rundown if he didn't play well, just because we want to talk a little bit about him. It's not the end of the world to support this guy in in the best way that you can. Well, and I understand just from their perspective the uh, this idea that club first player second which is how it should always be it is about the badge on the front it's not about the name on the back but when someone has a really good game or you know they everyone has found a way to sing a song about a particular player i mean for william it's about the tottenham journey and maybe for christian right now the easiest thing to do is going to be chanting usa and if you're offended by that, well, I don't know what to tell you. His name is Christian Pulisic. He's American. He plays for your team, and he just scored a hat trick. And as Jan has told us, that's exotic. Yeah. And uh, that's the <laughs> first time I think I've heard like of being an American as something that's actually exotic. So this is pretty exciting. This is all around <laughs> a really, cool. really great day. <laughs> Dude, he's... Okay, well, he's, his nickname by the media, by Chelsea, by even Chelsea social media and Chelsea media is Captain America. Like he's playing off that because he's Captain USA. You know, the English love that. The British love that. It's fun. It's exciting. It's different. It's exotic. Play off the Captain America. Chant USA. We've got something different in West London. It, you know, why not buzz off it? And again, I'm a little bit shocked to hear to hear you guys talk about him in this way because, dude, can you swear on this podcast? Yeah. Fuck yes. Okay. Well, he's can a fucking, you? <laughs> he's a fucking good player, man. That this kid was brought for Dortmund when he was 15. He was, you know, he, he's the jewel in the crown for a huge nation of sport. He He's played loads of Champions League. He's got so many top fight. You know, Liverpool really, really wanted him. Liverpool, the champions of Europe. This is not just some American kid who's like, this is not like, the fullback from Newcastle, Yedlin. Do you know what I mean? Who's like an okay Prem player. This is like, he's like super, super talented. He has an absolute wealth of experience. Boy, he arrived at Chelsea when he was only 20 years old. It's in, it's an insanely good purchase. And anyone who feels like they have to tiptoe around talking about Christian Pulisic have been swept up in some weird, obscure media cloud. Just look at what's in front of you. Look at the stats and metrics, chances created, you know, everything he's done. And just, Drop everything else, man. Mic drop. Done. Oof. And we are. Yeah. We're going to mic yeah. drop our way right into an ad break. Uh, and a huge shout out to the sponsor. When we're back, though, we are going to be talking about our midfielders, giving some love. And then we're also going to talk about uh, the rest of the team and do a quick fire from Discord. So thank you to the sponsor. We will be right back. All right. So next part of this is we have to continue to shine the light of love at the midfield. And to be fair, it's kind of... Uh, funny when we say midfield we really don't want to talk about the attacking three specifically the holding two with Kovacic and Jorginho um, they are forming quite the pair there Dan uh, from what I've seen uh, it was fun uh, DPZ from We Ain't Got No History had a fun little uh, video clip tweet of Kovacic just turning and spinning out of two players and, and just breaking pressure he he seems to really be hitting his stride as well. Nick last week saying, or in midweek saying ridiculous things that he never thought that Jorginho would be so important to this team. Uh, he can't imagine the midfield without him. It, it's another week. It's another performance in the books. Where are we at with these two? Angola who? Well, uh, 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 let's not go that far. Yeah. But what <laughs> whoa, I will say... Whoa. What I will say is it's taken us up until this point in the podcast episode to mention N'Golo Conte's name. And if you think about structurally where we thought about the type of players who were going to be immediate locks in the lineup heading into this season, N'Golo Conte was in every starting 11 you created for Frank Lampard's side. And we, we didn't know who the strikers were going to be. We thought maybe we had an idea of the center backs were going to be. It was like, it was Conte and Keppa were the two. Those were the two players that you knew were going to be in every starting 11. And the fact that we are now on this win streak, 
seven wins in a row, all competitions. And Golo Conte has been out injured, has been struggling to get back to full fitness. And as we've talked about, like put him in the hyperbaric chamber, let him recover to 110% before you bring him back out for the remainder of the season. But Kovacic and Jorginho have done a really damn fine job of helping us feel okay that N'Golo Conte is getting the time, Nick. And that is, I think that's the biggest testament to how well they're playing is the fact that we are not super concerned or as concerned not seeing N'Golo Conte's name on the team sheet or on the substitute sheet. We want him back, but the fact that we are not freaking out that he's not included is the testament to Kovacic and Jorginho. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you bubble wrap him and Golo Conte and put him off to the side, and and I'm glad to hear Frank say like we got to get him right. You know, like we can't risk these small injuries happening every two weeks. That makes me feel good that they finally learned something. But uh, apparently, you know, our boy uh, Nizar Kinsella was saying that you know ahead of the Europa League final that there's no way that he should have played, and then he went and played a full. Full ninety because he's a machine, but apparently that set him back for now. What is six months? Um, so it, bubble wrap him, put him aside. Jorginho and Kovacic this season, when Kovacic has been healthy and available to play, have been so dynamic. And I will tell you, you know, I think Jorginho is kind of in a class of his own because he's capable of of such quick thinking on the ball. If you're not quick in body, Brandon, you got to be quick in mind. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think he's there. Kovacic yesterday was just taking the piss out of everybody. I mean, it was it was like his show. Like, if Christian Pulisic was not on the field, he would have been man of the match again. And it was just like, you know, if it wasn't Dave against Ajax, it would have been him. You know, he is just there or thereabouts, and he's causing chaos in the midfield. And all it does to me, and is it moves – you know, like he moves the conversation forward and then frees up Mason to do something. You know, it's just it's one of those guys who's so flexible that he's he's able to put the ball where it needs to be to be dangerous. And I'm I'm so pumped for him, man. I, I can't imagine the team without him right now either. Yeah, man. I tell you what, a quick word on like a couple of them. Jorginho, I'm a huge, huge fan of. He is um his met defensive metrics were good last season, but they're getting better. He's obviously uh, enjoying playing for Lampard because he's no longer in a restricted zone. He can move about. Um, you know, he's immediately he was given the vice captaincy. Lamps is always singing his pieces, talking about how important his like you know his leadership qualities are. He's a very I say he's like a cerebral player because he knows where everyone is. You know, I know that it's the the whole register concept, but it's not just that because that came with like systemic sorry stuff. But he generally knows what's going on. And if not, he'll encourage people. He was the first one to walk off the pitch yesterday that was just angry about the two goals rather than being, you know, stoked about the win. And that's what that's Chelsea. Do you know what I mean? So he's like one of the most Chelsea players in the team and He's a, he hasn't even been here that long, and you know, so um, absolutely love Jorginho, and I love how Frank Lampard's loving him too. Mateo Kovacic, man, like, I don't know if you saw the tweet that I put out yesterday, but I'm a little bit worried how it's gone a little, little bit too viral for my liking. Thank probably Gate Seventeen Marco for that. But I um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I tweeted Kovacic has been superb for Chelsea. The day he scores his first uh, goal, I'm gonna run down the street. Naked with the Croatian flag painted on my buttocks. <laughs> now, I've uh, I've I tweeted that less than a day ago, and it's got like four and a half thousand likes. That'd or something. be a good bet. <laughs> well, it's push. It's going to be on five thousand likes soon, and you know it's it's had too many retweets, and loads of people have screenshotted it and stuff. So I'm you know I have to f- get really good at Photoshop or something. Um, but yeah. Mateo Kovacic, you guys made a really salient point. I think it was either uh, Nick or Dan talking about it about how. He's been so, so good playing out of the press, progressing the ball up the pitch, um, dribbling, just turning people. We did it last year against City. He did that a Maradona roll around the City players. Um, we know he's silky. He's a Galactico, isn't he? He's Real Madrid into Milan. He's silky on the ball. He's getting better and better. Again, Frank Lampard loves him. He, re- he keeps saying, I really love him as a lad. I feel so bad when I can't put him in the team. And I don't know, Brandon, if you feel the same as me, mate, but... An injured N'Golo Kante that's coming in and out of fitness and the Mateo Kovacic that seems to be getting better and better and better. I'm not saying he's better than Kante, but would you fear for the chemistry if you're dropping in and 
a, out a Kovacic who's played a lot and you're dropping in a Kante who hasn't played much who might be trying to get over an injury. Does that you know cause concern? Well, definitely. I mean, that, that kind of, the two players that hold that role rely on each other a ton. I mean, they have to know where each other at at all times, who's filling what areas on the pitch. Uh, if someone's getting forward, they both can't get forward. I mean, there's just a lot of responsibility there. Um, mm-hmm. They're so crucial to essentially transitioning from offense to defense and defense to offense. So, yeah, I think anytime, like these two clearly have a partnership, and anytime you change it, it will have normal effects on the team. Uh, but it just comes back to N'Golo N- Kante needing to be fit. This The crazy thing is him unfit, you think back to the Super Cup against Liverpool, is still miles ahead yeah. of most, yeah. which is disgusting to think about. So you know just how valuable he is. But to me, like his... It's kind of funny. Like, we don't need him in the Premier League right now. Like, we're doing well. We're answering the question. We're going to need him in the Champions League. And so if we can get through the group, progress, that's where we'll really need the full health, Ruben back, Conte 100%, Rudiger back, just because those games are so much harder and more intense. It takes more out of you. You recover less. Um, if we do make it to the knockout stages, that's when the the squad fitness is going to be so much more important, you know, mm-hmm. come January and beyond. Can I quickly say, like, if, if a healthy 100-plus percent N'Golo Conte comes back. I think at this stage, it's a 4-3-3, and Mason is likely the one who gets sacrificed out of that group. Yeah. And it's not because he's playing bad. I mm-hmm. don't think that. I just think the team, as as it functioned last year with N'Golo being able to press up in a way with sustained pressure that Mount still hasn't cyborged his way into yet, <laughs> Um I just I think Mount's probably the one who gets sacrificed, or Lampard moves Mount out to one of the wings, and there's a lot of competition out there again. Um, I think it just depends on the match. I was thinking about that. I don't think you can take Kovacic out of the team right now. I Uh, I think he would really struggle, Dan. I think the situation ends up becoming that Kovacic actually will get opportunity to rest, and that's where there, in my mind, it becomes the ability to now rotate players which is what we don't have a lot of luxury with right now, where you might have then the opportunity to give Kovacic 30 minutes off here. You give him the opportunity to maybe get a full 90 off one day. I mean, those are the type of things where, you know, having Barkley available, even though the the drop down from Mount to Barkley is pretty substantial on our side, at least maybe not for the England team. Um, <laughs> and that, that's something where, at least having them available to give some of these players breaks so that the legs don't get so heavy so that we continue to see sharp performances. That's where I would be most happy for it to change. I mean, I, I concede that I don't know how the starting 11 would end up looking, but I'm more about wanting him back so he can start to rotate because we're going to continue to have very, very heavy fixtures for the remainder of the year and hopefully beyond. And that is going to mean that we can't just rely upon the same starting 11 match in and match out, Brandon. So, Jorginho made more recoveries, 13th, than any other Chelsea player on the pitch versus Burnley. Key in midfield, thanks to Squawk of Football on that. Uh, looking at who scored Kovacic, all right, he had a shot today, all right, so that's important for him. But he had uh, I mean, three dribbles. Naked soon. <laughs> <laughs> he had three dribbles, four tackles, uh, was dispossessed three times, but that just shows you kind of his variety. And again, he's a deep lying midfielder in this team, putting in the tackles, breaking up play, also dribbling people to get forward. Uh, he had a good little day out, to say the least. Uh, and then obviously, Jorginho was passing it unbelievable accuracy. It looks like oh, well over 90% uh, of his 95 passes were completed. So um, fantastic for him. All right. And so the last point, we'd, we just would be irresponsible for us not to talk about the goals that we conceded late in the match. Uh, I, it was funny. I was listening, obviously I'm sure most of you all were as well hearing Arlo White saying, Oh, and the Burnley supporters are returning to their seats here in the 85th minute. Uh, interested to see what happens. Those who have left early have turned around and come back. And I just, Oh, I laughed, but then I got sad because that meant they felt like they had a chance. So, uh, obviously 84th minute, absolute rocket, 86th minute. Another long distance shot. Just weird that it all kind of fell apart right at that point. 
So just real quick, guys, react to these goals. So that's what I'm interested in. 84th minute, 86th minute, a couple of screamers, bangers. Uh, you know, Yan, do you think it's we made subs, we got lazy, we got complacent, or did people just hit the strikes of their life? Dude, um, I know you were joking about like, well, your the commentator he was talking about people getting thinking there's a chance or whatever. Uh, you're right. Logic defies Burnley getting a, anything from that game, but I still inherently felt sick and, and just I know that you know I felt like this is I don't know because that that fourth goal by Willian after watching Leicester absolutely break records the previous evening against Southampton, I was thinking rubbing my hands together like oh Chelsea might just get a few here, um, but you know it went the other way, which was disappointing. And Dre Rodriguez. Credit to that guy for not even celebrating the tiniest bit after that goal because, oh my God. I mean, I feel bad for Kepa for not having a clean sheet, but that goal, damn. I mean, maybe he should have been closed down better. But it was just such... Maybe. A, I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, he should have been closed down better, but what a hit. I mean, when people are that far out, I was thinking more Hendrick, you know, when he's far out, he scored absolute whop. But, um... Yeah, you know, it was dumb. For me, the first goal, I didn't really give a shit about. What an amazing goal by Rodrigo. It's shame we haven't got keeping a clean sheet, but we've still got a plus three goal difference on this game. No worries. The second goal, I was like, right, this is bollocks. Do you know what I mean? The second goal was the one that, that was the slap yeah. in the face. Yeah. And you were like, I know it was a deflection, but we shouldn't have been turning like that. For, I, I don't know. Again, more, more so perhaps closing down the spaces and just being resolute because Chelsea were under pressure so when you're under pressure you're like right regimented shape because we can all sense we're freaking out here guys um i think i said in my match review it's just shades of the residual naivety of this team and the full narrative we can discuss and dissect it here but the full narrative is that's okay because at the moment everything's okay it's not perfect chelsea have got better defensively We've got better defending set pieces, and when you don't concede this, I know we got pretty lucky that Barnes just didn't fancy it that, that day. But um, again, the biggest problem in open play for me to finish my ramble here, um, Dan, is that on transition, Chelsea were being better, but this wasn't like a clear transitional thing, it was just leaving them time on the ball. Um, so it was frustrating. The first goal away was a whopper. I kind of it perversely enjoyed the first goal because it was like a sort of funny consolation great goal like, oh good for you Burnley but the second I was like right this is bollocks but I don't know if you felt the same Dan <laughs> yeah it, it was it was a letdown to the end of it I think it took just a, a touch of shine off the overall match especially when you look at Leicester just absolutely pummeling Southampton I mean they've they've fixed their goal differential for the entirety of the season you know they're mm. like plus 17 now we're plus seven and you know, crazier things have been the difference makers between who gets the appropriate seating at the end of the season, who ends up becoming champions. You know, it, it's it's come down to goal difference before. So these are things that we shouldn't take lightly. I mean, Tomori's comments did mention he t- felt like it gave Burnley a little bit of extra gusto when we should have been comfortably seeing out the game, but it's still a positive result in three points. I think that sums up perfectly is that, yeah, it sucks. We shouldn't do it. We'll learn from it. We'll coach on it heavily, Brandon, and then we can go and try to not repeat that mistake moving forward. Look, it that late in the game, legs are tired, uh, but you're protecting the goal. No, no one sets up like, all right, we're going to run this, and when we get to 30, we're letting it rip. There we go. Like The probabilities of Burnley scoring one of those, like on your XG, you can probably barely <laughs> see that dot let alone them mm-hmm. scoring two that statistically like that's normal we, we like Chelsea would normally give some space in those areas because they're not going to get tight till you get closer to the box where the the you know situation becomes more dangerous so while it was a little bit fluky it was still super annoying because it did take a little bit of the shine off the match overall but again um credit to the team for being four up at that point and kind of earning the the ability to to give up a couple wonder goals and not have it bite us. You know, earlier in the season, that would have been a 2-2 draw. We would have left wildly deflated, super upset. 
Um, but we're not. We are still pumped about Christian Pulisic. And we've tried to bury this late in the script in case people aren't listening, so it's not a big deal. I mean, <laughs> tactics, right? <laughs> Just like the match. It's perfect. Can I can I quickly praise our, our defense? Because I thought you know, the switch to this half-man, half-zone marking system is working a little bit better. We have to realize, and I know that we all are thinking about Leicester just annihilating Southampton, basically relegating them there uh, (laughs) where they stand. Um, But (laughs) if you think about, if you you think about uh, Burnley, it is, but I mean, (laughs) good luck now. I mean, um, think about Burnley. Okay. Burnley is a much better team than Southampton. They had 13 total shots, five were on target. I think they are. I mean, they um, shouldn't be, but yeah. They, they shouldn't be, but they are. I mean, unequivocally, they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just thinking they, they, of coaching players because they've got much better players and a much better coach. Yeah. Because they've got Hassan Hull. Hassan Hull is a great coach, man. He's like an attacking great coach. I mean, I don't know if it's unfair on Dyche because Dyche They have is, four yeah. more points than Southampton. Four. I know, <laughs> but, uh, it, It's fucked. I mean, it's fucked up, man. I don't know. I just... I, I can start... Yeah. I watched um, Gary Lineker's little face on match of the day, man. You should have seen him. Anyway, sorry, mate. Go on. No, you're good. I think I think Zuma in a game against Burnley where they have kind of some bigger guys uh, in and around the box, I think he was really solid yesterday. Clearly got up for that, banged his head on the side board thing and yeah, got point. back up, toughed it out because there are really no other options there. Um, and then Tamori's tackle in the box was exquisite. Um, and yeah risky but i mean damn that's it's pretty incredible and then dave transitioning over to left back again like it's 2014 Mm -hmm. um because we don't have depth over there right now so it's it's just you know i think that back line wasn't perfect yesterday they they did kind of flub you know burnley did flub a couple of chances um but you know overall there was some cohesion there and i i liked what i saw from most of the game can I just say they did, you know, some screw up chances, but this is the kind of luck you get when you're going to win the Premier League, boys. So, you know, you just get used to it. All right. I love it. Uh, that's a stat as well. So that's that's a fact. You can't deny yeah. that. When yeah, you yeah. have luck, you win the league. Luck points so won from yesterday. Place the bets yeah. now. No, please that's don't. Um, all right. Quick Dan of the match pool run the table and then we're out of here so let's get this going dan i uh i actually would like yan to read out your options and and maybe give us his idea because i'd be interested in your perspective of uh of our options here okay bear with me one moment while i find my dan of them okay here we go oh fuck's sake right (laughs) 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 right here we go ladies and gentlemen in last place we have apple pie, which kind of, I think that should be up there, really. Second place, closely off fourth, uh, third place, sorry, we just skipped third there. Third place is bald eagles, which um, I think yeah. we might be here. Yeah. <laughs> Insert sound effect. <laughs> I think we're seeing a recurring theme here. I think second place is probably undeserved considering the previous uh, choices. Budweiser is in the second place with 6%. We've gone 4, 5, 6%, by the way, rather <laughs> appropriately. Leaving um, leaving Marcus Alonso at 85%. <laughs> Christian Pulisic, Captain America, clean sweep, making history for Chelsea Football Club and American soccer. I mean, how American are those options? Uh, let me planned. try and think of something else. Uh, uh, fireworks was going to be one. You know, we like blowing those up on the Fourth of July. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to corn dogs. Tailgating. Yeah, baby. That's it. Now we're to, talking. I love Let's it. Let's go. The yeah, state yeah. fair type stuff. <laughs> yeah, Food on it. a stick, deep fried. That's uh, it. Quick and deep fried Oreos. Man. Oh yeah, there you go. Freedom number one. Freedom. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> well, obviously that would have you know you know negated christian so we had to keep that out yeah, so yeah, yeah let's, understandable. Be, let's be sensible let's be sensible yeah. <laughs> all right well the table as it stands quick asterisk liverpool arsenal palace spurs united norwich all about to play as we wrap up a recording right now uh but with that being said liverpool still top of the table man city second leicester city on 20 points third place Chelsea, fourth place, 20 points. But thanks to their absolute mugging off of Southampton, uh, 
you know, to be fair, I thought four goals was really going to help our goal difference, and then we botched it a bit. Uh, they mm-hmm. are plus 17 in goal difference. We are plus seven, so quite a bit of work to do to catch Leicester City. Well, and, Never and, thought I would have said that. And they've conceded half the goals that we have, which is their benefit, too. They have so, conceded eight goals. There's that. Um Anyways, Arsenal are in fifth right now. Palace, Crystal Palace in sixth, going to Europe. Sheffield United seven, Bournemouth <laughs> eight. To Europe. <laughs> Croydon on tour. <laughs> West Ham nine, Tottenham ten, Wolves eleven, Burnley twelve, Brighton thirteen, Villa fourteen, United of Manchester fifteenth, Everton sixteenth, Newcastle well, seventeenth, Southampton eighteenth, Norwich nineteenth, twenty. Watford. The Pookie party has ended. Uh, it sounds like the Hassan Hoodle party has ended. Uh, Everybody's canceled in the in the bottom three. Everybody. Uh, the Marco Silva party is canceled, and the Ole <sighs> party might be canceled as well. Uh, tell you what, interesting table to say the least. Um, just so crazy. Our our Premier League. Pre- did you do predictions, Yan, at the beginning of the season of who I would did. go up and uh, down? I did. Are yours well, as no. silly as ours? No, okay, so I had Leicester City to finish fourth place and everyone laughed at me preseason. I was like, mate, they're gonna be in the they're gonna be they're gonna be top six, maybe top four. And oh. who's laughing now? But then again, I've gotta come clean. And I also did a Nick Villaney and I put Chelsea seventh, so I think I had him sixth, so I'm much more optimistic. I than don't you. know. <laughs> <laughs> We're splitting hairs at that point, fellas. We're but anyways, both going to um, Europa, man. Look, with Liverpool, Arsenal, Palace, Spurs, United, Norwich all still to play, um, there's a lot of movement that can happen in this table yet. So obviously uh, more to come on that. Uh, But that is our episode. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email us. Let us know how Yan did. Uh, We're really interested on a scale of 1 to 10, what you guys thought of him. No, you're brilliant. We had an absolute fun chat hanging out with you, Yan. So thank you for uh, coming on and joining us. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Where, where can people find you on on the uh, on the medias everywhere? Running down the street naked with a Croatian flag on my buttocks. Yes. <laughs> he's got too many. He's got too many burner accounts. We can't. That's a, that's a ringtone right there. Is that what yeah. that is? Just uh, at Chelsea Yannick at Football Yannick and Football Therapy on YouTube. We'll have all the links obviously in our podcast as always. Uh, Dan and Nick, thank you as well. Listeners, though, thank you the most you are the best the community that we have around this podcast in chelsea is amazing and we thank you for being the lifeblood of it but until next time chelsea fans you know what to do keep the blue flag flying high